Welcome to Dan's Talks. My guest today is Catherine Zoka, who is the co-owner of Canio's Bookstore, which uh, is on the brink of extinction. And uh, the reason for that is I'm told that she's shaking her head. No, that sounds like good news. We'll get to that. It's thumbs up. That's wonderful. We can talk about about what what's going on and how uh, how you had what we had heard was that you had lost the lease or not lost it, but they raised the price or something, and uh, you're looking for a new place. That's where I left off. What's the new news? Well, first of all, thank you, Dan, for having me on representing Canio's books. We appreciate that. And the the news, the update for those out there listening is that, you know, Canio's indeed did lose the lease at 290 Main Street, where we've been the Southern Gateway to Sag Harbor for 44 years. But the bookstore itself, while we don't temporarily, we do not have a brick and mortar place. We are committed to looking for another location. And we have been looking for a location really for the last year to try to find a place in or near Sag Harbor. So that continues. Um, we, we, the, the owner of the current of the building that we were in, basically did not renew the lease. It was not a negotiation issue. It was her desire to be able to renovate the space. So we put um, our collection, our wonderful collection of books uh, and other memorabilia in storage. And the, the wonderful sign is in storage, and the goal is to reopen the bookstore at another location. But meanwhile, as you probably know, Dan, we launched a not-for-profit, Canio's Cultural Cafe, in 2009. So we have an educational on, uh, not-for-profit that will continue doing programming in the area. For instance, the Moby Dick Marathon, we will have that again in June of 2025. And we will do a, no, a number of other uh, programs at our at locations that we have partnered with over the years. So let's uh, I think there are a lot of people that are unfamiliar with Canio's who might be watching this. And I, I would probably say that Canio's bookstore um, is probably as legendary to the book industry, not industry, but readers, as um, Stephen Talkhouse, the uh, music site in Amagansett, is to uh, live music. And it's a treasure for this community to have both of these places. And um, so that's why I wanted to talk to you about how things might proceed. If you don't have a physical space, how would you do the reading? Where would it be? Moby Dick? Well, you know, actually, over the last decade or longer, when we do the Moby Dick Marathon, we have moved it all around the village of Sag Harbor. We have five or six other um, host locations that we've partnered with, and that includes the Whaling Museum. Uh, that includes the Old Whalers Church, which we love to do the sermon portion of Moby Dick at that location, which is fantastic. The church, the new uh, church and uh, art church in Sag Harbor. We've also been at Eastville Community Historical Society at the library. So all these locations, uh, plus many others in the area, welcome us to do programming going forward. We've also have done a lot of programming at the Christ Episcopal Church in Sag Harbor. So we 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 um, we go beyond the borders of the bookstore, um, and we have been doing that, and we will continue to. So just so people know. Um... The book Moby Dick, which has a chapter about Sag Harbor in it, is read in relay form by authors and writers in the community over, what is it, six days? Well, we do it over three days, and uh, people sign up in advance. They read a 10-minute section. We have a you know program where the name is printed in it. So it's it's a great community event. You know, people from 14 to 84 have read in the uh, in it, well known and unknowns, and people who haven't ever read the book before, you know, the idea is to really encourage people to read a book that, you know, while it is one of the treasures of American literature, is daunting to a lot of people out there. And so the marathon, hearing the language read out loud, has inspired a lot of people to actually 
get you know forge their way through the book and complete it it's it's a it's a miraculous journey and i think you've been on it a couple of times so and yes we had um what are some of the other uh things that the cafe uh nonprofit does well it isn't it i'm sorry i said beside moby dick so it's an educational nonprofit. So both myself and Marianne are teachers. I'm actually a photographer and I teach photography. Uh, Marianne is a writer. She teaches writing workshops uh, as part of the cultural cafe. In addition to that, we have other programming readings of different writers or forums about different literary subject or issues that uh, are of a, a, a great interest to the community. We do a lot of events uh, along the line of the environment and natural resources. So that's just one, that's just a couple of samples of what we ha have done and will continue to do going forward. What would they say uh, when in your publicity for these these events? How, how, well, how would they would they be? Would you have an author? What is, what, what exactly is the uh, uh, the arrangement that happens when you do such an event? Give me an example, like Moby Dick. Well, we do. You know, the the events range from a simple hour long event um, in in either the store or now at another location to something like the Moby Dick Marathon, which is probably the more complicated or the most complicated event that we do since it is over we range over the entire village over a three-day period but so some examples would be we would have an author come in and do a reading from their book followed by a q a that's a very simple basic thing we've had authors ranging from people who live in the area and have published their own book to the likes of colson whitehead who is you know an internationally renowned a Pulitzer Prize winter winner over a, you know two years in a row, someone that and also someone who has a presence in Sac Harbor. So we're always delighted to be able to host Colson when he gives a talk. Uh, in addition to that, we also celebrate International Women's Day, where people come into the store and we have like a brown bag lunch and then just d have a discussion about uh, issues involving you know, women in our area or nationally or internationally. So those are just a couple examples of the kinds of events that we offer. Is that what you're what you're looking for? That's what, that's what I wanted to know. But a lot of them are taking place in the store, the physical store. So now you'd have them in some of the other locations. Is that how that would work out? Yeah, and actually mentioning Colson, I have to say the last two events that we did with Colson Whitehead were both off campus, so to speak. We had him speak, I guess, two or three years ago at the Uni Unitarian Universalist Congregation Meeting House, spilled out crowd, well over 200 people. And then just more recently, he spoke, uh, we had him speak at the Christ Episcopal Church. So uh, while Obviously, the bookstore is beloved in terms of the actual physical space itself. You know, we recognize that that space, uh, especially post-pandemic, uh, didn't give enough elbow room for some of the people that we wanted to feature and some of the events we wanted to do. And so, therefore, we have been having hosting events off off-site for some time. Well... Would you would you say you can get along just fine without a physical bookstore and I keep your books in storage or is that still a goal? Sounds like you must resign to not being able to find something. How long have you been looking for it? Oh, we're not at all resigned to not find. Just to, you know, to clarify, um, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about the fact that, number one, Psych Harbor is a community and it's a community of different organizations that came that come together and support each other. In fact, there used to be well, it's in hiatus right now, but an organization called the Sag Harbor Cultural District. We would meet monthly, many of the non for profits in Sag Harbor, to talk about programming. And so that at that that really strengthened the bonds of all the organizations, and we started doing having a lot of cross disciplinary engagement on activities. So that we like you know we will be continuing doing, but. 
there is nothing like the alchemy of coming into a bookstore and talking to a customer about the kind of books that they love and are really interested in and being able to make a recommendation of a title that they might not have known about. So unquestionably, for the audience listening out there, I want everyone to realize that we are absolutely committed to looking for a new space. And we have been looking for a new space for almost a year at this point. We've had a couple of uh, op options that came very close, but due to zoning and renovation requirements have not actually been realized yet. So uh, while we can continue to do programming with our partner locations, you know, the goal is to actually have a, a place to land. Like I said, we have our collection in storage right now. So we're actively um, taking good care of that as we look for another place to, uh, to, to, to be. Has the uh, government, the Sag Harbor government, been uh, helpful or friendly, or are they giving you a hard time? I can't imagine they would give you a hard time. Not at all. The village of Sag Harbor is, you know, likes Canios, would like Canios to continue in Sag Harbor. And so where there would be an opportunity for them to be able to help us, they will be there to help us. Um, talk out about how it really came about. I remember what what it was like when there was another another uh, business in that location there on Main Street opposite the deli, and because uh, I've been around so long, and uh, then I remember meeting Canio Pavia, uh, who founded the bookstore, who was I believe a teacher, but he was quite in, in the city. I'm not sure exactly how it all came about. Maybe you could tell us about that. Sure, sure. I guess now, we, do you remember it being an electronics store? Because it was an electronics store, and then it was a Goodwill store, right? Which, do you remember both? Or? I don't remember which one it was. I just, you know, it was one of those I was passing by. I used to sell the advertising for the paper in all the stores. And that, that particular location, I don't think I was ever into sell. It didn't seem logical to me. But I remember him coming in. He was a wonderful man. Yeah. Well, I ask about the electronics store because a lot of a lot of the young guys who grew up in Sag Harbor used to come into the electronics store beforehand. And and then when we took over the store in 99, they would often come in and say, oh, I remember we used to have the you know, the vacuum tubes for the TVs back there, and we would drink beer in the back. Anyway, uh, but yeah, in 1980, Kanye Pavone, who was a teacher um, in Mid-Island, I believe in Babylon at the time, uh, was on jury duty, and he was brought a book along to read while he was at jury duty, written by Joe Pintaro. And Joe Pintaro was a Sag Harbor writer, and the book that he was reading was set in Sag Harbor. So Kanio decided after jury duty was over to drive out to Sag Harbor, where he saw a for rent sign in the window of 290 Main Street. And so he had always, you know, been loved books, had been occasionally bringing used books into the city to pedal, I guess, on Fourth Avenue and near the Strand and thought, oh, wow, it'd be great to have a bookstore there. So he went away for a little while and said, well, if it's still for rent in a couple of months, maybe I'll, you know, I'll go in and I'll rent it. And so that's how that, that's how the business began. And so really for almost the first decade, I think he, he was continuing to teach. So the store was only open on the weekends, um, you know, during the during the year. And um, and so he then, you know, in 99, um, after being there full time for uh, a while, decided he wanted to retire. And that's when Marianne and I took over the business. But it's it's what is the there's a, a difference between a bookstore and Canio's bookstore. I mean, you can go into any bookstore today and you will know right away that you're in a different place. It's uh, and and uh, it's so special in there. And I wondered if, how how did he or or you come upon the idea of making it what it is with books everywhere in the store. You have to. It's um, a lot of them, old, old ones, used ones, um, but quite a collection. 
Yeah, exactly. Thank you for, you know, having the vision to to perceive that. I, I think, first of all, it's a, it's a collaborative effort between, you know, Kanio early on and then Marianne and myself. And, you know, the idea is that the inventory of the books grew out of our own passions that we have for the different types of literature that are out there and also what our customers like. And so we tried to develop both a new and used inventory that would appeal to people coming you know, who either live in the community or visit the community as a resort community. And one of the best compliments we receive and, and, and we hear it often is that when they people walk in the door, they say, ah, a real bookstore. <laughs> so, you know, it's the books are forward in the store. I mean, we, we do have some uh, local crafts um, on offer as well, but really the goal is to offer people books that they're not necessarily going to get, you know, at at your regular sort of cookie cutter store that that's out there and nothing against those kinds of stores. But I think that uh, Panios and like Shakespeare and company and some of the stores in the city, they have their, they have uh, their own unique sort of footprint. And that's based on what the owners bring to the, you know, to the, to the space. I mean, part of the reason Mary and I took over the business was because we really wanted to have a community gathering space. It was really important for us. Um, we have a have a gallery. I mean, I'm a, I'm a visual artist. We have a gallery in the space. So we, you know, highlight the artwork of the people who live in the area. And we wanted to be people to be able to come to have discussions about, you know, topics that are on people's minds. And so that's a lot of what went into our into guiding how we would you know conduct the business over over time tell me tell me are you born and raised out here or in Sagar in uh, on the island or what's your your history uh i from i'm not uh, a long islander uh, or new yorker i was born and raised in in maryland the great state of maryland the eastern shore uh, you know, really, no, just out in, in Montgomery County, outside the outside of D.C. But I've been in New York, you know, more than half my life. So at this point, it, I almost feel like I'm a New Yorker. Do you go back and forth to the city still or are you primarily out here? I'm, I'm, I'm primarily out here. Uh, you know, I, I started coming out in the early mid to mid 80s. And, you know, I have a f photographic series called Vanishing Landscapes. And, and I documented a lot of the farmlands in the area, you know, in the 80s uh, and 90s. Uh, so that was a big part of the attraction to the area for me, the, you know, the the rich beauty of the, the farming landscape, which is now, you know, for those of you listening who haven't been out here for the last, or have only been out here, let's say the last decade or two, uh, it, it might seem surprising to hear that we had such rich farmland out here, but Dan, you know that, you know, Scuttle Hole Road used to be for farms from one end to the other, and Sagaponic. Um, so, Hedges Lane in Sagaponic was named that for an original settler around 1645, around there, and today it's known as Hedges Lane because it's bordered all the way from one end to the other by hedges. And uh, it's, it's just a tremendous change. I had uh, an experience on that road I'd like to mention. Um, I used to commute from East Hampton to my office at that time in Bridgehampton by motor scooter. I had brought had one I had brought down from Cambridge where I was in college. And um, I uh, there was on Hedges Lane, if you were at one end of it, which is about two or three miles long, I think maybe two miles, you could see all the way to the mm. other end, as well as uh, the farmland on both sides and also the the mist from the sea when it was rough. Anyway, uh, I would start down that and this dog had discovered my routine. And he was way down at the other, he lived way down at the other end of Hedges Lane. And as I would he could hear this strange sound of this particular vehicle, which was unusual here. It was a Lambretta motor scooter. And I'd be buzzing along, and sure enough, he'd 
come out to the middle of the road and sit on the white line, stare at me a mile off, <laughs> waiting, waiting to see if he couldn't catch me as I zipped by. And of course, he never could. But um, it's a, a memory that um, I'll never forget. And uh, there's just uh, so much that's changed here. Uh, by, uh, by the way, did you know Priscilla Bowden? Because she felt the same way about it as a painter. Some of her scenes that she did, I think she's that are no longer around. I have a painting she did of where the, the free life, the balloon took off, which is no longer a, a true. A, a, uh, in any case, um, did you know Canio before he opened the bookstore? Oh, no, not before he opened the bookstore. No, I, I, you know, I met him during the course of being him being at the bookstore, but um, I wasn't here in 1980 when he first opened the store. So I didn't I did not know him. I was just wondering what motivated him or or put that idea or that you followed along into. How did that do you know how that came about or how did it come about for you? What attracted you to want to make this your life, really your life's work as he did? Well, as I said before, I mean, Marianne and I had thought, I had talked about having like a, a community gathering space, you know, a place where you could have art, where you could have readings and the like. And that kind of dovetailed with Kanio deciding that he really wanted to retire. And so that was really the the impetus behind us, you know, taking over the bookstore. And 1999, Sac Harbor is a lot was a lot different than Sag Harbor 2024. So there was a, a much more of a sense of the arts community at that time than maybe there is today because Sag Harbor has become, has gone from, you know, what Wilfred Sheed called the Unhampton to being kind of like the It Hampton now. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Wilfred Sheed, he was a, a writer who lived in Sag Harbor. His wife, Miriam Ungerer, was the great, you know, uh, food uh, cookbook writer as well. And they were part of Sag Harbor's literary constellation at that point in time. And so the village has really kind of shifted from then to where it is now more of the, the it Hampton, so to speak. Well, I could discuss that with you for a long time. <laughs> I, re I remember when it was all broken down and uh... There were yeah. just drunks on the street and the factories and the moon whistle and it was a whole industrial area. But I, th I think they, everything changes over time in Sag Harbors. Uh, but some things deserve to not change. And my opinion is that Canio's is one of them. And I'm hoping that you can uh, find another location nearby, somewhere in Sag Harbor, or even become part of some public institution that could have you as a bookstore within it. For example, the church or the uh, movie theater. I mean, right when you said uh, so much, uh, there's so much cultural activity now in the, in Sag Harbor. It's uh, amazing and um, proud to be uh, someone who enjoys it. And I'm sure you are too. Yeah. I want to thank you for being on the podcast. We're running to the end of it. And uh, I, I, if anybody out there wants to get involved with finding Canio's uh, physical location for its collection, uh, just stop in. Uh, and when this is over, when is that? Well, the lease is already over, so they can't stop in, but they can contact us at our uh, at, at, on our website or via email or via our phone number. They can call us. And I just would also like to say if, if they want to support us, we are we do sell online on bookshop.org and bookshop.org is a nonprofit, a competitor to Amazon that supports independent bookstores around the country. So if they just go to bookshop.org and select Kanye's books, we'll get credit for that. But we we are casting a wide net. We have looked very creatively at different ways that we can have a presence and any suggestions we would welcome. And, and we thank you for this opportunity, Dan, today. Thanks for being on the podcast. Talk to you soon. Okay. See you in the harbor. <laughs>